questions in the Q&A portion. I'm going to uh, reintroduce Sheikha Maryam quickly uh, before moving on to the next portion. Sheikha Maryam received her master's in education from UCLA. She holds a second bachelor's degree in Islamic studies through Al Azhar University. She has studied in Egypt, memorized the Quran, and has researched a variety of religious sciences ranging from Quranic, Quranic exegesis, Islamic jurisprudence, prophetic narrations and commentary, women's rights within Islamic law, and more for the past 15 years. She's been interviewed by her work by major news outlets, including BBC, NPR, and CBS. And she is the creator of Garya, the Women Quran Reciters app, which is available on Google Play and Apple stores for free or on www.garya.app, inshallah. With that, I welcome Sheikha Maryam back to the stage for the Friday lesson. Assalamu alaikum once again. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillahi kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi. When I was in college, I got bit by a spider. And I'm sorry if you've heard the story before because I shared it on social media, but I want to make a link to it in anxiety. When I was uh, hospitalized because of that bite, I it severely impacted the size of my eye, subhanAllah. Um, it was really a trying time for me. And I left that experience very, very scared of spiders. After I got out of the hospital, for the many years after that, anytime I saw a spider in anywhere, I would become so scared and I would call anyone else to help me just get rid of it immediately. And then very recently, I walked into the restroom one night and I saw a spider there and I didn't want to wake anyone up to take care of it. And I was too scared to go anywhere near it. So I closed the door. I put a towel under where there is the gap and I just hoped that that spider would not come out. When I walked in in the morning, I looked around and I couldn't see it anywhere. And you know, sometimes spiders might go into a crack somewhere and just go somewhere. And I thought that maybe that potentially that's what happened and it was gone, which is honestly really scary <laughs> for someone who's scared of spiders because you don't know where it could have gone. So I looked around, I didn't see it. And then as I was turning, I suddenly noticed that it was actually on my shoulder. <laughs> when that spider was on my shoulder, I saw it. I absolutely freaked out. I ran out of the bathroom. I started screaming and crying and making dua. And then I sat there. And then I realized that there was a spider very, very close to me, but it didn't bite me. And that I wasn't in the hospital, alhamdulillah. And that I didn't have a reaction because it didn't do anything to me in the first place. And that moment for me was profound because I had gone from a very how I felt was a traumatic experience being hospitalized because of a bite to recognizing that anything happens, anything that happens is something that subhanAllah is, is fully, fully in Allah's control. Of course, that's different when it comes to abuse. It's different when it comes to the harm that other people cause to others. But I'm simply speaking about the idea that a, a spider, a spider that subhanAllah had so impacted me years ago, didn't touch me this time. That allowed me to face my immense anxiety about spiders. And now, alhamdulillah, I can take care of spiders all on my own. I'm able to get a plastic cover and put it on top and a paper and walk it out. And I will absolutely be screaming and making dua the entire time, but I can do it. That exposure for me allowed me to feel like I have power over a place in my life that I felt so powerless. And why I wanted to share this story with you is because it might be relatable if you have a fear of spiders. It might seem kind of silly, but it's probably something that many of you have heard of. Arachnophobia, people who are scared of spiders, people who don't really like insects, is something that is not uncommon. But something that I've heard sometimes people say when there are individuals who talk about their doubt in Islam or their fear of their exploring their Muslim identity or not knowing how they stand with Allah, the anxiety that they feel about whether or not they believe in Islam or they still want to be Muslim. A lot of times I hear an almost dismissal of those emotions that when someone is asking a question about uh, a doubt that they have, 
sometimes the reaction is simply, well, if you believed, if you had stronger Iman, you wouldn't have this question in the first place. And of course, that's not every scholar's response at all. Of course, we have amazing scholars who listen and who try to help someone process. But unfortunately, it is definitely a sentiment that's felt by many and that many experience. And when, when you don't know someone who has those questions, when everyone in your family is Muslim and they pray and they worship and no one has ever had these types of doubts or certainly hasn't ex ex um, said them out loud, then sometimes I've also heard from people who say, who are these random people that you talk about? Is it like some random person in a random corner of the internet? Are these people even real or are they just troll accounts? And for me, even that lack of recognition that this is something that's so commonly asked, especially by the high school, college, young professional age group, shows to me that there's a disconnect. There's a difference between saying, I don't have that struggle, but I recognize why other people might and saying that doesn't really exist. And why are we talking about this? And you just, you're just trying to cause fitna by bringing up all these issues. I think being able to share it in a way that helps us understand that like, like the fears that we hear that other people have, which maybe to some are silly like being scared of spiders might be silly to one person. Sometimes that fear comes from a place of trauma, like how I felt I experienced. When it comes to anxiety with faith, I had a young woman share with me that the reason that she struggles so much with her religion is because her father told her since she was a little girl that Allah doesn't love girls the way he loves boys. That Allah created girls to serve men, to serve her father, and then when she gets married, her husband, that she's the one responsible to cook, to clean, to take care of her brothers, that her brothers have rights that she doesn't have because she's a girl, and this is what Islam says, and this is what Allah wants. And that perspective of who she is as a girl, that she has no status, that she has no worth, that even to her own father, she's worthless because she wasn't born a boy. Of course, it impacted the way that she saw Allah. I want to parallel that with the mentorship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because the mentorship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a father we can see even in high anxiety spaces or moments that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had mentored women to feel like they had the resilience and the fortitude and the courage to move forward. As a father, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one time was making sajda and some of the nobility from the Quraysh, they took the insides of a camel and they put it on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he saw this and he comments that he wished at that time that he radiallahu anhu was able to go and help the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he was from a very vulnerable class and he knew that he wouldn't be able to go and help and instead, Fatima radiallahu anha, Fatima radiallahu anha as a child, sees this scene. And I want you to remember the, the city, the, the, the society of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa at this time was burying their baby girls alive. One. Two, women were being inherited as property. It was common for one man to marry up to 20 women. It was common for women to be seen as no one, no, nobody's, as less than property. So for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's daughter, a young girl, to have the confidence to go in front of the nobility of the city when they are abusing her father, to have the courage, the confidence, the, the, the resilience, the self-esteem to know that she can run out there and, and, and whether or whatever the outcome that she's going to take a stand is a very powerful reflection in the investment the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made in his daughters as a father. 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this Fatima radiallahu anha, let's consider the entire life that she led. She led a life in which she lost every single sibling, every sibling she had. She was the only sibling left when she passed away, radiallahu anha. She lived a life in which she lost her mother, radiallahu anha. She never knew her uh, her uh, father's mom or dad. She didn't have grandparents from that side, radiallahu anha, and sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She had a life of extreme poverty, of her loved ones going to war multiple times, of living through the persecution and the boycott, of seeing her mother pass away because of the persecution and the boycott. Radiallahu anhum. So we see a life in which Fatima radiallahu anha could easily have been so full of anxiety that she was unable to cope. Having anxiety is normal for all of us. The anxiety of seeing a bear or the anxiety of seeing something that is threatening is a very healthy emotion. It is healthy to have that anxiety and for your body to take action because of that anxiety. But at the same time, there is another type of anxiety. There's anxiety disorders in, in which that anxiety is obsessive. And please don't underestimate the importance of seeking professional help if you have an anxiety disorder or if you're constantly going through anxiety. It's not enough to simply say, I make dua and I hope Allah will answer me and I read Quran and it helps with my anxiety. Of course, of course, that's enough. Reading the Quran, of course, it's enough. But if you have an anxiety disorder, read Quran and seek professional help. However, what I'd like to share with you is that researchers of anxiety have, have, have spoken about two things that can help someone with a lot of anxiety. The first is mentorship. And the second is focusing on the action that you can do in the moment. And so Fatima radiallahu anha, despite having lived a life in which she had every reason to have immense anxiety, and I'm not speaking, I'm not at all implying that Fatima radiallahu anha had any sort of anxiety. I'm just saying that to any human being, this type of constant type of trauma and, and loss and pain is definitely a cause for anxiety. Fatima radiallahu anha, as she was passing away, she was very sick. And Asma bint Umais radiallahu anha, she was a companion who had made a uh, migration from Mecca to Abyssinia and from Abyssinia to Medina. So she had lived in Abyssinia for some time. And when Fatima radiallahu anha was speaking with her as she was very sick in her last days, she was telling her that she is concerned that people will be able to see her actual body when she passes because the shroud is covered on the body and it kind of shows the shape. It's so interesting how... SubhanAllah, even in, in Islamic law, it's not something that's required to, to, it's not required to put the body in a box to take it from the place of the prayer to the burial. But Fatima radiallahu anha was very concerned about this. And so she told Asma bint Umais, and Asma bint Umais radiallahu anha, her response was that she had lived in Abyssinia and she had seen that the people of Abyssinia had a sort of boat, uh, that's not a boat, a beer. I don't know how to say this, B-I-E-R, a beer, a beer. I don't know, but this kind of like box, like coffin thing that they created with twigs and leaves and all of these natural elements. And so she suggested that she makes this for Fatima. Fatima asked for her to make it, she made it. And she suggested that Fatima be taken in this from the place of the prayer to the actual burial. And Fatima radiallahu anha saw that and she thought that that was very, um, that, that, that was very great. She, she, she wanted to be buried in that and she was not buried in it, sorry, taken from, from it so that the shape of her body wouldn't be shown. And the reason why I think this is so powerful as an example is because from the beginning, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so invested in his love and care for her as a mentor. Like I mentioned, remember, anxiety and mentorship. Mentorship makes a difference. From the beginning of her life, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when she would enter a room, he would stand up, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and make space for her where he was sitting. He would see her, he would stand up, and he would give her a kiss, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the love and the care that he had for Fatima radiallahu anha. So no matter how much pain she experienced and she suffered through as a human being, that type of loss over and over is it's not something you forget. It's yes, the sting of it may may lessen over 20 years, but the memory, the pain, the loss, the, the missing never leaves. And so Fatima radiallahu anha, despite all of this, 
she was firm in her not only belief of course but also in her practice and wanting to even do extra in her practice because of this of this mentorship of the prophet ﷺ, because of her belief because of the strength of that belief in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another example we can see is in the example of asma bint Umais herself when um, abu bakr radiallahu anhu was passing away and she was married to abu bakr at this time and abu bakr had asked for her to be the one to wash his body now, Asma bint Umais, radiallahu anha, also, she went through immense, immense trials in her life from migrating away from all of her family and her loved ones to Abyssinia, from having her children in Abyssinia, three three of her children in Abyssinia. Now, you, if you're a mother, you know how hard it is, or, or a father or, or someone who raises young kids, you know how hard it is to have young children all alone, away from people who can support you as, as, as grandparents or uncles and aunts. And of course, she had the small community who came with her from Mecca, but that's not exactly the same as, you know, having that community that you've grown up with there and having that type of support system. So subhanAllah, she is now you know, a mother of young children. She lives there for a number of years before she goes to Medina. Once she goes to Medina, very quickly after she goes to Medina, her husband is martyred in the Battle of Mu'tah. It was the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. So now she is a widow. She's gone through one difficulty after another. And we could say that someone in these circumstances, they've gone through so many anxiety-inducing experiences that they may not be able to handle the type of um, the type of uh, uh, serious responsibility of something like washing her husband's body. Now, I want to take a moment to talk about women when it comes to death, because a lot of times we've heard, maybe you yourself have heard, and I'd love to know, please share in the comments, have you been told this as a woman? Or if you're not a woman, have you heard this about women? That women shouldn't um, you know, women are too emotional. Women will cry and scream too much. Women can't be, you know, anywhere near a grave because of this. Like all of those ideas of a woman not being able to handle this type of this type of loss. And yet, Asma radiallahu anha, in the face of all the pain she's experienced, she is she's the one Abu Bakr appointed to wash his body. It wasn't his sons. It wasn't his other children. It wasn't um, any of the companions. Omar radiallahu anhu, Ali radiallahu anhu. It was his wife, Asma bint Umais, and the resilience and the effort and the, and the fortitude of that moment to me is another example of someone who was mentored by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mentored by a community who believed and supported one another through that belief, and also someone who did the action, took the action, focusing on the action. And Maryam alayhi salam is an excellent example of this particular of this particular point of anxiety. Because when Maryam alayhi salam is is giving birth, now we know the angel Jibreel when he told her alayhi salam that she's going to have a baby, that she's going to have Jesus, that her reaction wasn't like, I've been chosen. It was one of fear and 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 shock and Jibreel alayhi salam, angel Gabriel, the way that he uses the words to describe Isa, he uses the words that tr tr um, translate to a gift and glad tidings. Isa is called a gift and glad tidings. And so he's called these things. But when Maryam alayhi salam is giving birth, you know, she might have made statements of joy and excitement and, you know, maybe being can't she can't wait to meet her child. She might have said those things, but Allah did not record any of those statements if she said any of them. The only the only statement that Allah recorded her saying in that moment was ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasiyan mansiya I wish I had died before this and I and that I was something forgotten and never mentioned that she had never even been born she wished she had never even been born and that's what she's saying in this moment why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala record that why didn't he record anything else maybe she said other things maybe she she spoke about her gratitude to Allah maybe she spoke about how excited she was Instead, the only part, maybe she didn't though, maybe the entire time this is all that she said, Allah is the only one who knows, but he chose to reveal in the Quran forever, time, forever, this statement of her. And it's such a validation. SubhanAllah, there's no greater statement of anxiety than a statement of wishing that she had died and had never been born. That's a very anxious statement. Now, why does she make that statement? Scholars discuss whether it was because of her physical pain, her emotional pain, or because she was worried about the way that the people would see the the, the practice of piety because she was the symbol of piety and she was worried on the, the reflection that it would have on piety in general. So 
the reason for it could have been many, just like reasons for anxiety could be more than what we can see or other people can see when we're going through it. But what does Allah do? The, the next verse is an affirmation of how she feels. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to reveal how he responded to her. He didn't have to reveal that ayah. He didn't have to reveal the response to her. But in doing so, it's an affirmation of validation of how she's feeling. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks her to take an action. The action being shake the date palm tree. Subhanallah, this moment of doing something, even though she's literally giving birth, is a form of cutting the cyclical thoughts of anxiety and focusing on something she has control over. There's a lot of things in her moment that she doesn't have control over. Can she shake a date palm tree? I mean, dates will not fall from any of anybody shaking a date palm tree, but she's doing something. It's something that allows her mind to focus beyond the anxiety. And then what? After he orders her to rest and to relax, to eat, to drink, to relax, then what? Allah orders her to go out with her baby. And that is so incredible because, again, it's focusing on an action she can do. She's taking charge of the narrative. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't require, didn't, didn't uh, order Zakiriya alayhi salam or Angel Jibreel alayhi salam to go out with the baby. It was specifically Maryam to go out with her child. When we look at this story and compare it to the mentorship of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's something that we can see the, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the walking Qur'an. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the walking Qur'an, that means that the way that he helps people as they process their own emotions is reflected in the Qur'an. And so when a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he's so overwhelmed with his emotion and anxiety because of the sins he's committed, because of the wrongs that he's done, he goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so overwhelmed with all this anxiety and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells him to say, and he's sitting and he tells him to say, oh Allah, your forgiveness is greater um, than my sins and my hope in you is greater than my hope in my own actions. Um, your your uh, forgiveness is greater than my own sins and your mercy, your compassion is greater than my own hope, my own my 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 own hope and my actions. And the Prophet Sallallahu my own hope, the Prophet Sallallahu tells him to say this dua three times and then he tells him, stand up, you've been forgiven. Now, how powerful is it? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't tell him, now feel sad about everything you've done for the next five years. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specifically focused on the action. Say something, make toba, stand up, change your state, change your physical state, stand up and move forward. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching us what psychologists and researchers tell us now about ways to manage anxiety, the mentorship, the action you can focus on to change your physical state, to change the direction of your thoughts. This is the beautiful, powerful recognition that Islam gives for the human interaction and real human emotion that all of us are going to experience as we face tests in life. But, but in the Quran and the Sunnah, we have the literal example and solution. And of course, make sure that you work with a therapist or a professional doctor or psychiatrist as you're going through any of these things. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of you. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashiru anna ilaha ilaha ant nastaghfir ka wa Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh Maryam, what a wonderful uh, Friday lesson, mashallah. I wanted to, um, first of all, tell the audience that it's our Q&A time, so you can share your questions in the comments or email questions at celebratemercy.com, inshallah. And I wanted to share this comment by music lover saying, my only daughter passed away last year. I managed my emotions at the grave, and I was the one consoling others. We women have a strength that some cannot understand. Allah gives the strength we need. SubhanAllah. I'm so sorry for your loss. May Allah enter your daughter into the highest paradise and make this immense pain um, one that is full of um, comfort as well. May Allah fill your home with angels that surround you, that bring with them barakah, this blessing and protection and mercy. May Allah rejoin you with your daughter in the highest paradise without uh, reckoning and bless you with dreams of your daughter in paradise. And the fact that you were there consoling others is, yes, of course, a testament to a strength that 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 is, that so many cannot even imagine. But it's also a testament to you 
It's a testament to you and your belief and the way that you carry yourself in that belief. And may Allah bless you and ease this loss on your entire family. I'm so, so sorry to hear that you've lost your daughter. That's that's a, a that's a type of pain that subhanAllah really connects you to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The fact that he lost every single one of his children except Fatima radiallahu anha before his own passing, it's something that is unfathomable, but it, it, it it's a it's a connection with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that only few truly understand. And may Allah protect you and bless you in your life. And I'm so, I'm so sorry again for your loss. I mean, thank you so much for that dua, Shaykh Maryam, and for that beautiful comparison and the connection between the, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our dear sister also said this was a much needed conversation and uh, she said Jazakallah Khairan and may Allah grant you increase. And you. Um, going to the first question for today uh, from Sister Lily Rose. She said, why is it that this particular narrative about a woman's role is constantly pushed from generation to generation? Where does that come from? Paternalistic culture or lack of knowledge of both genders? Uh, Lily Rose, I'm not sure which part you mean by the particular narrative. Um, if you're talking about the idea of like women at, at the grave site, if, if that's the one, um, I guess let me just comment on that particular point unless you meant another one. So there's a few different parts of this. One, Islamically, so pre-revelation, before the Quran was revealed, um, the society of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Oh, I'm sorry. I just got a clarification. Uh, woman as men's property. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so this idea that woman is women are men's property. Um, do you mind bringing the question up one more time so that I can just read it in that context? Why is it this particular narrative? Okay, so like women, women being owned by men about a woman's role constantly pushed from generation to generation. Where does that come from? Oh, okay. <laughs> I can definitely, definitely answer that, inshallah. I've done a lot of research on this because I, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, just finished um, the manuscript to a book I've been working on for years. Um, and thank you, Lily Rose, for clarifying. And a lot of it just looks at this, like why do we have these notions? Um, so there's a number, a number of reasons why. And obviously this is not exhaustive because we are in a short Q&A session and this can't be like a whole um, <laughs> history lesson on every part of the Ummah. But there's a few parts that we can look at. Number one, um, Sheikh Akram Nadawi, Dr. Akram Nadawi speaks about a very um, clear connection between scholars, Muslim scholars who were... Um, translating books of philosophy into Arabic. So they would translate books of philosophy into Arabic and the ideas of the philosophers, the Greek philosophers of that time then got merged with Islamic work. So if you are reading a work and this is something that I can alhamdulillah like do now, but I couldn't do it when I first started studying, I can do it now. I can read the opinion of a scholar and I can see when his personal perspective is put into the ruling versus the juristic legal ruling from Islamic law. And when when we're not able to make that distinction, the ideas from Greek philosophy infiltrated the ideas of Muslim thought. And so when the philosophers took up being the rulers of the Muslim world for a time, the ideas surrounding women, such as women don't need an education, women are less than men, um, do women even have souls? Like, yeah, some of these are explicitly against Islam, for example, do women even have souls? But things like women don't need an education, if the people in positions of power use that power to create policy, like the policy of closing the madaris, the schools in which women were learning in, which women scholars were teaching in, how is that going to impact the next generation of girls, of boys, of men and women, and the way that they see women's roles. If in a hundred years, nobody was there before those rulers came into power and didn't see the way that women played such a critical role in the environment and creating the environment of scholarship, that just becomes their norm. That's the norm that they've grown up with. That's the norm that they've seen. And that's the norm that they pass on. And if that's what their teachers are teaching them, and if the only scholars in their time period also ascribed to this belief, then we can imagine how they are teaching. Now, what's so important is for us to recognize that in the Quran and the Sunnah, we have very clear statements of a woman's intelligence, of a woman's, of the capabilities of women and the roles that women played in the way that women played roles 
impacting every aspect of society, whether it was political or economic or militarily or spiritually in the masjid and their families. We have all these examples that were affirmed and approved by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we have a long history of women scholars and Sheikh Akram Nadawi, who already mentioned, is really someone who's put so much effort into translating so many of these works from Arabic and researching a lot of these statements that he put together into one book, it's called Al-Muhadditha, is just the introduction to his longer series called Al-Wafa Bil Asma. But Al-Muhadditha in English is an important resource for any woman and any man who's seeking to kind of understand this, this, this dynamic and, and the role of women scholars, Hadith scholars specifically throughout history. But that's only one of so many issues. I um I've 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 done research specifically on um, looking at the idea of menses and why some women believe that menses is a punishment from God. And that concept is not seen in our books of fiqh anywhere, anywhere. It is not seen in the books of Islamic law. It's not seen in the Quran and any sort of prophetic statement. So why is it that so many women believe or, or question whether if they get their period on the 27th night of Ramadan, if it's because of a sin that they committed at some point, that concept of it being because of a sin or becoming being some sort of curse or some sort of anger from God is actually one based in colonialism. It's a particular Christian thought. And 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 Christianity today is practiced in many, many different ways. I don't at all mean to imply that this is something that every Christian um, uh, denomination is teaching their churches. But historically, when we look at a particular time period and the way that colonialism impacted the the muslim perspective on certain issues it makes sense that we see that muslims today which is only a few generations from modern day colonialism also carry those types of misconceptions thinking that it's actually related to islam so this is just two examples of many obviously the history of, of women in islam is is is, is vast and in, in depth and just so so multifaceted in every way we can't cover on the q a um but it's important for us to recognize that sometimes these thoughts these ideas these concepts are not coming from our own sources they're coming from outside sources that impacted muslim majority societies or muslim communities and it's really upon us to be very intentional about seeking knowledge and changing that dynamic for the next generation of muslims Inshallah. And in terms of seeking knowledge, I would recommend Rabata, R-A-B-A-T-A. -A. It's specifically for women and as -Salam Institute, which is for men and for women. Rabata was founded by Dr. Tamara Gray. She's the Shifa who, mashallah, has spoken at, at Celebrate Mercy. Um, and then there is uh, as -Salam Institute, A-L-S-A-L-A-M Institute. And it is the Institute of Dr. Dr. Akram Nadawi, who is the Hadith scholar that I just mentioned. And inshallah, you, you, you can take courses with either one and start to learn about all of these issues in more detail, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, uh, Sheikh Mariam. I think it would be really helpful if you could put the title of the book and oh, the yes. author in the chat, just so we know what to look up, inshallah. And thank you so much for that answer, um, you know, highlighting the fact that a lot of these concepts uh, come from outside of uh, Islamic thought. I'm just going to share that uh, book and the author with uh, the audience. Um, but I, I wanted to say, like, we can all, can we also say that it was part of the culture um, of the people at the time? And, you know, it's just outside of Islam, but culturally, socioculturally, um, it, it is, it was introduced from outside, but it, it was also the norm from before the Prophet's time and maybe oh, parts of that. that stayed, uh, you know, on the commentary. And yes, absolutely. Um, perhaps not specifically at that time, because w the Prophet Wasallam's companions were able to see him and see the change. Um, but when we look at um, the commentaries of scholars much later into the future, or not necessarily much later, but into the future, we do see some of those statements within scholarly um, discussions. And I didn't want to touch on that here because that's a very nuanced discussion and a whole another topic. But yes, we do see those statements sometimes. And it's important for us to realize there's a difference between the Sharia, which is the sources of Islamic law, like the Quran, like the Sunnah. And there's a difference between fiqh, which are people like you and I, gaining, well, scholars, taking rulings from those, um, those sources and coming to rulings on how we should live our lives within an Islamic legal system. Islamic law is an actual legal system. It's you take it, you take the issues to court and you go through a legal system. And so when we're looking at that, there are times when there's a scholar who will say something that is very, 
very confusing to read as somebody who doesn't see that sentiment um, in the Quran or the Sunnah. And that's when we make that distinction that sometimes some of, you know, there could be a great, great scholar who might have been influenced by a particular reality in his time period, who might change his opinion if he lived in this time period and was exposed to the differences of this time period. But we say we can take the legal opinion and with all respect and appreciation, but not necessarily accept the personal reflection portion that might be in contrast with what the Quran and the Sunnah actually share, mm -hmm. teach. Yeah, uh, I was also wondering, have you read the um, text, The Tao of Islam? If you have any No, actually, someone just told me about this book, but no, I have not. Okay, okay. Well, if you read it, I mean, we would love to hear your thoughts on it. And um, Sister Lily Rose also said that she would love to Inshallah. read your research. Thank you. I know Please you have a, a book that's coming out. Is there any new information on that? Inshallah? Thank you for asking. Um, it's just going through the editing process right now. It takes a year to a year and a half for the um, for the actual publication process. So please make to offer it. Inshallah, I pray it'll be out by the end of next year or the year after that, Inshallah. Inshallah, Inshallah. We're definitely looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions here. Uh, someone asked, uh, can you please also comment on the issue of women at the graveside? So, okay. Um, yes. So this is like a whole nother fiqh discussion. Um, I'm going to give you like a brief overview, but really all of these points are really difficult to cover in like a Q and a when it comes to fiqh issues, because there's a lot of differences of opinion. Um, I'll give you the, okay. So, okay. Actually, um, can I, maybe we can do another session just on this topic because it's just very long. And I don't think I, I don't feel like I'll be able to cover the fiqh of it here. Um, I the the short answer I can tell you um, is that can you as a woman go to the gravesite? Absolutely, yes, you can. Um, it is the majority opinion that it is permissible to go to the gravesite. There are opinions that say that it's not, um, but there's a history to the reason for that that I think is so powerful and interesting. Why the initial prohibition was given, um, how that prohibition changed why some scholars still prohibit it, but uh, the majority allow for women to go um, as long as, uh, you know, there's not a concern for go falling back into the practices of pre-revelation. So for example, I have a friend who's from a particular country, I won't tell you the country, um, and she was telling me that it's a very normal practice specifically for women to go to the gravesite and begin making dua to the dead person, asking them to intercede with Allah. This is clearly like, against the the, lit, the 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 literal tenant of our religion um and 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 so she said that it's very normal for them to go and take clothing specifically to rip up and to scream when they're at the gravesite this is not something i've ever witnessed here ever um in the united states i've never witnessed something like this when i've traveled and i prayed janaza in other countries but i've never been to her particular country and she said this is something that she has seen many times now why am i telling you that because if there is a concern that there's a culture in which women do these practices, because now this is the other thing. Why do women do these practices in the first place? A lot of times women are not um, given access to the education very necessary to understand these issues. In this particular country, women are not in, this, in, the, in the area she lives in, women are not allowed to go to the masjid at all. The masjids are closed. Women do not go to the masjid. Ever. She... She is in her 20s and she has never been into a masjid in her entire life. Not in Eid, not Ramadan, ever. So like if women are in a society which they are not given access to knowledge and then they might fall into practices which are common in that culture. This is She doesn't live in a particularly Muslim majority um culture. So it's, 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 but it's practiced in that culture. Do you see how someone in this, in this space might fall into a cultural practice without realizing that they're committing major sins like shirk? <laughs> like it's not even a sin. That's a problem in aqid. It's a belief issue. So like, do you understand how like that could cause someone to not be allowed to go to the grave? Someone in that circumstance. So that's very different from the general circumstance of like our beloved sister mentioned earlier, Lily Rose, may Allah bless you and protect your family. That when she, I, I believe it was Lily Rose. I'm so sorry if I, um, said the wrong person, but I think it was, oh no, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. So, so sorry, Lily Rose. May Allah protect you and bless you. Uh, music lover, um, that she mentioned that um, Lily Rose was the one who had the other question. So music lover, when she mentioned that she had the strength to comfort other people, 
Like that's very, you know, that that idea of praying the janaza, following the janaza, which is a different discussion, but Ibn Hazm says, okay, I'm not, sorry, okay. Sorry, this is the problem with the fiqh is that there's so many discussions within discussions. But what I'm trying to tell you is the context. The context matters. When we when we go to a grave and we're going to grieve and we're making dua, this is acceptable for women. We should go. We are encouraged to go. And so it is permissible to go. Unless you are afraid that these types of practices that you might actually fall into in that circumstance, then don't go, don't, then don't participate in, in going to the graves until you know that that's something that you can work on. But uh, I've just, that's so far from the reality of most people that I've ever met that it's very hard to even fathom. So subhanAllah. But, but again, that's a very personal thing to say because this was my friend's reality and she, she's explained it to me. So I don't know if that was helpful because I feel like I went in a circle, but the super Quick answer is it's permissible in general, and there are those who also say it's not. I think there is an issue with, um, okay, all right, you're back. I'm back. Yeah, inshallah, sorry, I was having some internet issues, but no problem. Um, thank you so much for that answer. And just moving on to the next question, this one is, uh, pretty broad and, and general, but I think it, it might help a lot of people. Um, what is the primary role of a woman in Islam? Being the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one role, his worshiper and how you worship, that is dependent on your circumstance. A woman who is a mother does not have the same role as a woman who is not. A uh, woman who is financially responsible for her parents because perhaps she doesn't have any other person taking on that responsibility and her parents are um, maybe unable, to, maybe, you know, much, much more elderly and unable to um, take care of their own finances does not have the same role as a woman who is uh, not in that role. So every every single woman's circumstance her role is going to be different based on her circumstance. But what is the number one role that all women have no matter what? being the utmost worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and serving him in whatever way he has created roles for her in her life. Jazakallah khairan uh, for that answer. Uh, we do have some questions from the emails, so I'll just go to uh, the questions in the emails. Um, someone asked this early on, it, it's a, a fifth question, so I don't know if you have the answer. Uh, she, uh, someone asked, um, I would like the hadith regarding the return of borrowed items when a person has passed away and the family is unaware. Would this be in the same category as money that is owed by the deceased when he or she passes? I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's an issue I've never researched. I apologize. No worries. Thank you. Um, so just moving on to the next question from the emails. Uh, someone asked, how should someone help their siblings have a positive connection to their dean and build a relationship with Allah, especially during teenage years? Also, what methods would you suggest in navigating difficult topics, questions, and doubts? That's such a beautiful question you have as a sibling. It just shows how much you care about your siblings. So it really depends on your particular relationship with a sibling. Um, a lot of times sibling relationships can be really painful. Sometimes that's because of the role of the parents between the siblings. And so there's a lot of tension or jealousy or anger or resentment. And if that's the case, bringing up Islam sometimes, if the, if the sib other sibling is not really interested in knowing, can just cause them to go further away because they don't really want anything to do with whatever it is that that sibling um, is trying to Trying, they may see trying to push on them. So this really depends on the circumstance. And I always recommend speaking with a therapist because I'm not one. Um, and inshallah that they can help you like navigate this. But as a general rule, what I would recommend is just being their friend and them being in a place, having them be in a place where you know that they feel like they can trust you, that they can be vulnerable with you, that they can be themselves. Someone who is able to be themselves and speak to you about their 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 worries, their pain, whatever they've gone through, knowing that they're going to be believed and they're going to be seen and heard is somebody who can come to you with questions when they're struggling with Islam or they're wanting to learn more about it. And in the meantime, let's say you both go out and you go, I don't know, bowling, for example, and you want to pray um, and your sibling doesn't want to pray. You can invite them and say, hey, uh, I'm going to go pray Maghrib. Do you want to come? They might say no. Leave them. That's their choice. You go and pray. But keep doing that. Keep being the person who prays. Keep being the person who says, hey, I need to take a few minutes and go make wudu. Do you want to make, make wudu before we before we go out? But also do it in a way where you recognize their situation. Because if they're in a very 
painful place in their relationship with religion, even those reminders are going to cause them to not want to have interactions with you. So again, it's hard to assess without knowing the full picture. But just in general, one, make dua for them. Two, create space for them to feel seen and heard and comfortable with you. And three, if you're able to, remind them in a beautiful way to invite them, not remind them, invite them, invite them to share in the, in the joy of the practice with you. And may Allah bless you so much for hearing. I mean, JazakAllah Khairan for that answer. Uh, Sheikh Mariam, we have another question in the chat uh, asking about Umrah. So uh, they have heard two different reasons why performing the walk between uh, Safa and Marwa. So I guess, what is the reason? Um, I have only learned of one reason, and that is in following the example of Hajar alayhi salam and the way that she um, sought to um, find some water or some sustenance for her baby, that it's a commemoration of her act and her sacrifices, um, alayhi salam. I am not sure of another reason, so I apologize for not knowing what else to address. Um, but I also have to say I haven't spent an extensive amount of time studying the fiqh of that particular portion of Hajj, so I could simply just be unaware. All right. Jazakallah khairan, uh, Sheikh Maryam. I think that's all the questions that we have for today, inshallah, unless you see anything else that you would like to um, address. I do. I see Yusuf OJ. Was this a sister only stream? I just joined a few minutes ago. May Allah bless you so much, brother. I think <laughs> I think you're experiencing what women experience whenever we attend Muslim events, which is it's always examples from men about men and men's lives. And um, I grew up being very confused about fiqh rulings because it was always stated in the men's perspective. For example, um, Go to Jama'ah. When you go to Jama'ah, wear perfume that, that can be smelled by the person sitting next to you as you walk by them. They feel this beautiful experience of the people who come for Jama'ah without clarification that that's a ruling specifically for men. Like that was my whole life. And I'm sure many of the women here never hearing about women companions because we only heard about men companions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when we hear about women's rulings and women's uh, women's women's examples, they're for all of us, just like when we hear about men's rulings being for all of us, our brothers and our sisters and our sisters and our brothers. If we don't know about these things for each other, how can we support one another? It's the Prophet ﷺ was a mentor for both and he taught both and he was the perfect example of someone who who helped everyone learn. Um, regardless of uh, they, the Prophet ﷺ didn't say, you know, <laughs> uh, men don't ever learn the rulings of women or don't ever follow the examples of women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us so many examples of women in the Quran for all of us. And I know you know all of that. And I mean this with so much deep respect and sisterly love for you. Um, it's just so funny that I've heard that. It, it, so this, this wasn't a reaction to you. I've heard this statement so many times where I've heard a brother say, did I like go into the wrong space? And I'm like, why do you think you went into the wrong space? Like, where is that question even coming from in the first place? So it's just something to to think about. All right, thank you so much for that answer and so true, you know, that we always get advice for, for men and, and we're just like, okay, but you know, it, it all applies all around, but there are those nuances that are mm -hmm. important. That's right, that's right. I address as well. All right, Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh Mariam, for a wonderful, okay. wonderful thank you, um, uh, Friday jump session and for answering all our questions. We really appreciated it and we look forward to having you on the program again soon, inshallah. This is my honor. Subhanakallah. Mawbi hamdik nashiru anna ilaha ilaha atna sal ghfira kima natu wa alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mashallah, I hope you all enjoyed uh, that amazing session with Shaykha Maryam and the Q&A session. Once again, you can follow her on her social media to keep up to date with what she is doing and all the incredible stuff uh, that she does.